you know, sometimes the take is so ferocious at night that it's stripping the line out of your hand and you can't even strike. You know, you have nothing to strike into. Uh, but that take in the middle of the night when it's pitch black, no noise, nothing around you, there's very little in the fly fishing world that can give you that. Hello and welcome to the Ireland on the Fly podcast about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. While we may be still a few weeks off the summer runs of salmon and sea trout, in advance of that, we thought it'd be worth finding out more about catching sea trout on the fly in both daytime and nighttime conditions from one of the world's leading experts, Stefan Jones. Stefan is based in Wales, but has fished for and caught big numbers of sea trout all over the world, and he gives us some great insights into the setup tactics and flies for catching the elusive white trout. Stefan will also be appearing at the Irish Spring Angling Fair at Adair Springs on 29th and 30th of April, which is well worth checking out. And for more information, you can visit irishspringanglingfair.com. But first, Tom, we've covered the demise of sea trout in Connemara before in this podcast. And I'm curious, do many anglers, you think, predominantly target the sea trout or are they just caught as a byproduct of salmon fishing nowadays? Well, I, I would have to say I'd agree with you. They are definitely in, in Connemara. There wouldn't be as many people targeting them as they used to. But no doubt... All throughout the country, there'd be a cohort of anglers that do target them. You know, we still have we still have runs left in, in rivers in the country, and there are a few lakes that you can target them. And like for example, that said, I I would I would fish Lahaina and target sea trout in Lahaina. And oh, we yeah. would go to uh, Glenic Murren and Costello and target them then. But you know, it's um unfortunately, as we've discussed here before, they aren't what they used to be. Yes, exactly. Um, but, and we might just get into it, you'll hear more from Stefan talking about it, but in terms of maybe more people should think about targeting them on their local rivers, there is potential there. Yeah, it was not, that was fascinating talking to him. And, you know, he gave his tactics about, you know, how we go, you know, uh, fishing for them. And, and actually, more importantly, searching for them, which is very interesting. But, you know, I, I talked to anglers, you know, from all over the country, and, you know, the, there are rivers all around, you know, starting the southeast coast, right around the south coast, up the southwest coast, on the west coast, that do get runs of sea trout. All right, they're not huge, but they are completely underfished for sea trout, completely yeah. underfished. And, and it was when he was talking to us about, you know, how we would set about, uh, you know, fishing a, a, a river or, you know, how we'd go about fishing for sea trout with a fly. It set me thinking that, you know, God, there's obviously possibilities there for you know guys that you know the river is close by just to give it a go and I, I think it's it's something I I would definitely like to try and it would be interesting to see then I suppose figure out yeah if your local river has it and then what it would be like targeting the sea trout at night time as well yeah well like I mean the, the his tip there for how he would you know find fish in a pool and mark them and then mm. target them again afterwards I think it's bad you know and it, something you can really do and you know what it'd be great fun doing it anyway yeah yeah exactly did i tell you about the time i was um fishing for sea trout with ken whelan on the daughter no, <laughs> no oh you hold on we did well you no, no, because you didn't tell me you discussed it but you were in the book jesus it was a such a brilliant experience especially for the fact that you're standing there you're in um in the what's the name of the park i've forgotten the name of the park in the, uh, south dublin and there's the bus is going by, you know, you have the orange street light across the way. You're in the, the city, the city boundaries catching. You are, trout. aren't you? Yeah. yeah. You're in, you know, you're yeah. watching the Dublin bus, double deckers drive by and you're catching sea trout on the fly. Like it was just, it was bizarre, surreal. That, that is really amazing, crazy. actually. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. I just, and you know, I was saying to Ken, if you were just looking at the river, I said you could have been in Connemara, like until then the, the bus comes by and kind of shakes you out of your reverie. Like actually, that's an amazing fishery. I know we've discussed it. Uh, we should do um, a fishery focus on the daughter. Oh, we will. We will. Des Chew, if you're yeah. listening, um, I'll be calling you. But let's get back to sea trout now. Um, and let's hear from Stefan Jones. And I first asked him where he got his love of sea trout fishing. You know, you, you become, as an angler, you tend to become a product of your environment. So if you enjoy fishing, and that's why I kind of hate you know, kind of species snobbery in a way, uh, you, you don't really get a choice of where you're born or what you're born into or whatever. Uh, and yeah, if you enjoy fishing, you do the best of what's on your doorstep. And I was just really lucky to be you know, born equidistance between the rivers uh, Tyvee and Tawi. So if anybody knows kind of, you know, from a sea trout perspective, 
you kind of got the big three in Wales. You've got the Dovey, Tawi, and Tyvee. Those are your kind of big three sea trout rivers. Product of my environment, uh, as, as much as anything. Loved fishing. Uh, and yeah, these, these were rivers that were on my doorstep. And, you know, probably, yeah, probably the sea trout then captivated, captivated me the most. Yeah, and, um, literally behind me in the bottom of my garden, uh, I have the Tyvee. And the Tyvee has grayling, brown trout, salmon, sea trout. But it's it's kind of the intrigue of the sea trout from a you know, non-feeding well we can get into that if you want later but feeding non-feeding perspective um the night fishing there's a lot of different angles to, to sea trout which kind of captivated me the most and that's that's kind of what's what's driven me from from an early age and uh, still drives me to this day stefan i wanted to ask you did you start with sea trout or did you start with brown trout i'd have to say both randomly because my father so my father's never fly fished i've tried i think it's the kind of um the the the, the kind of adage of uh, ne- never teach uh, a family member to drive a car um <laughs> i i would also throw fly fishing into that mix uh so i've tried to teach my father uh to fly fish uh unsuccessfully but anyway my father started me off uh, and I, and it was basically uh, worming on small streams but tiny streams tiny tiny tributaries so you you'd kind of be targeting brown trout but inadvertently catch sea trout at the same time uh and uh, and also uh, i may say this is uh, a long time ago so i can't be uh, I, I can't be thrown to jail uh it was poaching as well so my father used to tickle trout uh in the in, in the winter months and all that uh, what a romantic so I, what a romantic phrase for poaching it's a long a long time ago <laughs> a long time ago uh i do hasten to add that uh but yeah i remember my father throwing uh kind of a three three or four pound sea trout out uh and me catching it and the sea trout slapping me in my face when i was like six or seven years old so i think i have kind of this love hate relationship with sea trout from a from a very early age <laughs> Stefan, can I ask you, I'm always fascinated um, that, that well, the Welsh coast, why is it that you've got such a focus on sea trout in Wales? Do we know in terms of the runs or is it the, that kind of adage of you get the fish there, more people fish for them, it becomes a kind of self-perpetuating thing? Or can you just fill me in a bit on that? So there's definitely, a, tr- you know, a heri- if you talk about heritage tradition, there's, the, you know, you talk about sea trout fishing, it's kind of synonymous with, with Wales. We just have, you know, rivers every corner you turn around so you have famous rivers but also you have lots of rivers that are essentially very very little known but they still have healthy runs of, of sea trout and i think it's kind of a heritage uh, heritage tradition as much as as anything you know a lot of these rivers have you know through decades or generations had healthy runs of sea trout and also you know a lot of our rivers are famous for for big sea trout as well which obviously holds holds a, a kind of a unique or separate appeal if you like um so i think a lot of it has stemmed from from that a in terms of numbers b in terms of the the, the size of the fish and then how that's kind of manifested into you know very much heritage tradition in terms of night you know kind of night fishing uh, development of very different techniques uh flies whatever uh, for, for the sea of you know, for the sea trout and i'd also say accessibility you know my local club, for example, you pay, you know, God, we only charge juniors, for example, they only pay two pounds and they can fish 30 miles of the, the river. Um, but then even through to, uh, you know, adults, I think it's like 150 pounds for the season. You have 30 miles of, of, of the river. Um, but there are plenty of clubs. You know, there's another club on the river, which is like 60 pounds for, for a season. So I'd say, um, you know, kind of accessibility as well. Perhaps historically, if salmon fishing was very expensive, I wouldn't say it was the poor man sea trout wasn't seen as a poor man sea trout, but uh, sorry, poor man salmon, but it was very much accessibility. Um, and yeah, again, just numbers and uh, and size. I think there was a lot of things like a, a, a jigsaw rather than just one one reason for that. That's interesting, actually. About the, I hadn't thought of it like that sea trout in terms of kind of the the worker man salmon in many ways, you know, in the sense that you'd be on the same stretches, you know, and yeah. then if you happen to catch a salmon, oh, sorry about that you know. yeah but also if you look at a lot of this you know and it's kind of sad in a way because if you look at a lot of the the famous um scottish salmon rivers in, in particular where you know they have some of those rivers have incredible runs of sea trout but they're you know 
God, not that long ago, they were, and probably to some uh, gillies, they're probably still seen as uh, as vermin in a lot of those rivers. Um, whereas actually, you know, under certain conditions, you know, when those guys are paying three, four, five hundred pounds a day, a lot of the guys not even turning up to fish if the water levels are really low, really clear. Actually, you can have incredible sea trout fishing uh, under those conditions. So actually, if they if they embraced sea trout, sea trout a bit more um, rather than kind of seeing them as a inferior and kind of, you know, ta- kind of step down their tackle uh, according to, to to what they're trying to target, they they'd have incredible sport rather than seeing it as a, again, it probably stems back to a bit of that species snobbery that it has to be this or it has to be that you kind of go, uh, you know, especially if you have limited time and most people nowadays have limited time. Um, if you have a, a, a weekend window or a week window to do something, you know, fish the prevailing conditions, not just not turn up because things aren't, aren't in your favor for a particular species. Yeah. It's very interesting there actually, Stefan, because, um, uh, we've often said, well, I've often said on the program here that sometimes the most successful anglers are the wealthier ones. And that's, no, you say and that that's about salmon. You say that about salmon anglers, Tom. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, Stefan said something very good there: accessibility. Yeah, exactly. And if you can, yeah, it's you know. But again, I if you took a lot of those guys, yeah, they they think that, for example, uh, uh, I love nothing more at this time of year than targeting a big brown trout or it doesn't have to be big particularly but a rising brown trout a, a, a wily brown trout at the start of the season on, on on dry fly where you're hunting down a given fish your approach has to be right uh you know your your line control there's so many different variables where sorry to be slightly yeah uh p- perhaps a bit crass about salmon fishing but Sometimes if a, you know, if a salmon wants to take, there's very little you can do to stop a salmon from taking. Um, and there can be a lot more skill involved in a lot of other, uh, you know, targeting other species. And if you kind of, you kind of embrace that a little bit, I think you become a better all round angler. But also if you do have a given fish that you do like pursuing, be that salmon, sea trout, brown trout, whatever, I think understanding some of the other species, some of that overlap does help you. Uh, in, in that primary target as well. That's very good. I'm glad you said that, Stefan, because only recently we were talking to a river angler and it was two against one of Dara <laughs> teamed up with Darius against me, right? So now we can team up against uh, Dara because I'm totally with you on having to fool a brown trout. Whereas when when a salmon is on, as you said, nothing's going to stop him taking your fly. I, I, Tom, I will hold my hands up here. And I have, I, in fairness now, you seem to have forgotten the, remember I always said there was, and I don't know if you remember Stefan, and I, I have to put it up sometime on social media is because I actually found I had taken a print out of it. There was um, an illustration in uh, Trout and Salmon magazine probably about 10, 12 years ago um, where it had the trout angler brain and the salmon angler brain. Yeah, and, and the trout angler brain was, you know, entomology, encyclopedias, you know, Latin terms, you know, all these kind of, you know, shelf full of stuff yeah. in the brain, you know. And the salmon anglers was cast step, <laughs> cast step, cast step. Yeah, it's an yes, absolute. In brilliant. your defense, you have quoted that before. Yes, <laughs> but you know what? There is actually something ex- extremely pleasurable about that as well but that's why again i enjoy most aspects of 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 fly fishing because actually swinging a fly for salmon that casting you know i get great great pleasure out of that but sometimes when people get very blinkered or Mm narrow-minded especially when it then kind of manifests into slight snobbery that that i don't get but if, if you kind of understand um, you know, some, some of the other angles that people are coming from. You, it, it, it helps you appreciate different types of fishing. But again, I do think you that insight helps with your overall approach in fishing as well. Tell me this, Stefan, the, uh, would your preference be for nighttime fishing for sea trout? Um, or maybe, sh- or maybe I should frame it another way. Is your best opportunity to catch a big yeah. sea trout at nighttime? Big? Probably Yes. And is that why you would be more likely to? No, you know, for me, the the night fishing is 
it's just so different. So the 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 take. So there's a lot of things that go into it. So I, I would say it's that kind of feeling out of control. So in the daytime, you can see your line, you know, you can see the take, you can see you know, everything that's going on, you can see what the fish is doing, you can see the fish slipping over the net, blah, 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 blah. You can see all of that happening. But what makes the the night fishing unique is you know, when that fish takes, you're not seeing the take, you're relying very much on touch feel. Um, when that fish is just whizzing around the pool, you have no idea where it's going, where it's stopping, what it's running towards, you know, if there's obstructions. Um, and then, you know, you're still netting, unless it's a very big fish, you're, you're netting it without even turning the torch on. So there's so much to night fishing that makes it so unique um it's not something you just jump straight into as you can imagine with everything i've just described there but you know when you kind of do lots of different things when you're looking for a new challenge and it, it definitely is more challenging but also in terms of the fish themselves they are definitely um more approachable at night i kind of say and people don't, you know, they kind of go really, uh, but you know, sea trout, sea trout in the daytime are like brown trout. So they're extremely wary, you know, it's kind of like, um, you kind of get one chance. Uh, if you spook the fish, you spook the fish, but at night they become a very different fish. I, I would, I would say, you know, under, under clear water conditions, you know, a sea trout becomes a sea trout to me at night. That's when the characteristics really change from, almost like brown trout characteristics to sea trout characteristics. Um, so that's what makes it, you know, more, yeah, more kind of unique in a way. But that night fishing aspect, again, you know, you, if you're getting even a four pound fish, you know, four pound fish cart wheeling around the pool and you have no idea what's happening next. Uh, and that take, you know, sometimes the take is so ferocious at night that it's stripping the line out of your hand and you can't even strike, you know, you have nothing to strike into. Uh, but that take in the middle of the night when it's pitch black, no noise, nothing around you. Um, there's very little in the fly fishing world that can give you that. And to have that kind of on your doorstep. Yeah, it's, you know, you, you count your blessings and it's not something I take for granted for sure. Actually, Stefan, there's something I want to ask you because funny enough, I do a lot of night fishing on the lake. Mm -hmm. um, nighttime fishing on the dry mito buzzer. Um, and one thing I want to ask you, because you obviously would guide people, you guide people for nighttime sessions, yeah? Yep. Um, I do occasionally guide people at night. But one thing I found was nighttime fishing wasn't everybody's cup of tea. That some people, you know, they go into it, then they would come out with me all gung-ho, and they just didn't enjoy it and didn't enjoy fishing in the night. Have you ever found that? Yes, but I would have to say, Tom, it, it, it's been rare. So I've so this year uh, would be my 27th year guiding at night. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've been doing, doing it for a bloody you, long time. You've had a couple of people out. So. I've had a couple of people over yes. the years. Yeah, uh, I would have to say that it's it's really rare. So I have people that to be honest, if they're coming sea trout fishing, they they're almost already in that mindset that mm. this is something they want to do rather than for example if you took somebody spinner fishing at dusk on the river and then you took the night fishing then i can understand some of those people being kind of uncomfortable or outside of their comfort zone but most of the people that come night fishing with me that's what they're setting this all out to do Right. Um, but what I, I kind of set them, and even from that perspective. So I'm, I, when I'm guiding, I'm never fishing, and I'm literally, you know, a meter away at all times from from the person that's fishing, and I always graduate them into the evening. So it's not the case of, right now it's pitch black, start casting. Um, so it's always I ease them into darkness. So we're always fishing like small, small wets and stuff through the runs and stuff as it's getting into dusk. So it's never really right. The lights out now right. are casting. And it's also, you know, a, a lot of things is it, frustrations. So if people haven't been guided, uh, I can understand a lot of them giving up, to be honest. And that's not kind of 
you know, uh, me, me promoting what I do, but there's a lot of pitfalls. Um, and one of the biggest pitfalls for sure, you, you tend to find with people coming through, it's like uh, ill-balanced outfits or what do I do if I get a tangle, this, that, and the other. And there's, there's often some really simple fixes uh, that you, know, you eye in them out and they, they just find the whole thing a lot more, more lot more pre- pleasurable. But over, yeah, I'd say like 27 years, I can't remember. There, there are some that kind of go, okay, it was a bit of a tick box and that's fine, but mm. not really kind of saying, there's a lot of people, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of people that will not go night fishing without somebody. But I think that's slightly different, especially if they're not used to being in the countryside, some of the noises and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of people that are yeah, insecure about, I have to be with somebody else when I'm night fishing, but uh, not kind of not enjoying night fishing per se, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it's just, I mean, I remember one instance with us, the boat was pulled up on the nearest shoreline. The two oars were left sticking out of it and they ran up through a field and got back to the car and um, sort of made made sort of strange excuses in the morning right? and it was a perfectly <laughs> calm evening like there was nothing wrong it wasn't yeah yeah so maybe they yeah they heard something but I've, I've had people in the boat that just yeah it weren't right yeah but it's interesting but i think what you said i think anybody going with you is probably sea trout fishing as an is expecting it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. With, with the midges out with you tom no, we're not too bad with midges, but we are. Okay. We actually aren't. So I couldn't even blame. We couldn't even blame that one on midges. <laughs> actually, Tom, can I ask you? Is there much? Obviously, you know, we know the rich history of sea trout fishing in Connemara, as we've covered on the podcast um, before. Was there much nighttime fishing for yeah. sea trout? I was lucky enough to get the tail end of good sea trout runs here, Stefan, before the collapse in yep. the eighties. And I fished them a lot with my dad. Only once did we go night fishing. And there was a friend of my dad's with us. And we got one, one sea trout. And my dad's friend actually caught him with a worm and a float. <laughs> and that was it. So, no, there's no tradition. And we actually were fishing on a river section of the system at that stage as well. You know? Interesting. Interesting. So it's really, really strange. I think... Uh, I, I don't know. Have you fished over here much, Stefan, for sea trout? Uh, f- for my sins, no. Uh, I have fished, uh, I tell you, there's two, two, two places. I have fished on the uh, Munster Blackwater. So I've actually dry, dry fly fished for sea trout on the Munster Blackwater. And then I have fished, uh, is it Cran or Coran? Oh, Coran. Coran. So I have fished Koran uh, and lost a nice salmon in Butler's Pool. There you go. Uh, but no, uh, to, for, for my sense, you know what, Tom, it's really ridiculous. So I live, oh, it's less than three quarters of an hour from fish guard. So I can do fish guards, Ross Lair, really, really easily. And for, for whatever reason, historically, I've always gone to Scotland. Uh, so I've always done like the Nith, and then all those types of rivers, especially up uh, down Freeway for, for sea trout. Um, and then the last few years, uh, kind of uh, my wife and I, we got uh, two young kids. We're like, wh- why are we traveling? You know, we went up to Aberdeen one year. I literally, <laughs> I was guiding until half past one in the morning, go back to the house. And then we drove 12 hours <laughs> through, the, well, through the night and into the morning uh, up to Aberdeen. And we're like, well, this is, yeah, this is crazy when we have, fish guard you know getting anywhere from west wales is tough uh but 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 getting over to my, my celtic brethren uh over the over in ireland is actually really really easy uh so we're making more of an effort on that front to um yeah to to, to kind of make amends and start coming over a bit more to be honest but i would say actually stefan in fairness like the numbers is the sea trade fishing isn't great and it's mm. been struggling um numbers wise i suppose what i'm trying to say is you wouldn't think of ireland as a primary sea trout destination yep. when there's a lot of other better rivers um, to be had. And actually just, I wanted to ask you that, have you, because we've seen it with Koran recently in terms of it's really suffering at the moment in terms of numbers. What about the Welsh rivers? Have you been affected much? Yeah, numbers absolutely. Wise? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's not, uh, 
I'm, I'm not here to uh, say everything is, is is roses by any stretch of imagination. No, there's been, you know, out, out, out from a salmon perspective, I think that's kind of pretty much the, the, the same all over. Um, the sad thing about the, you know, from a sea trap perspective is, you know, some small changes would actually see big improvements with, with us. So just talking about my, my home river uh, here, the Tyvee, for example, uh, we still have, uh, 15 nets working the river that's legal uh, totally legal netting so you have 12 coracle nets and three sane licenses on on the river so you have 15 15 nets uh issue uh 15 net licenses issued by uh natural resources wales which is like a, our environment agency um they don't have quotas uh so for example in a in a low water year uh, it was actually the covid year they had uh, just over a thousand sea trout averaging four pounds, averaging four pounds. So there's like, we have, we have a healthy run. Um, but what, what a lot of these rivers could be, uh, yeah, we, we are really just scratching the surface. You know, if you, if you look after, um, that brood stock, you know, a thousand extra fish averaging four pounds, okay, they're going to spawn that year. They may spawn another two, three, four times in, in their life. So the egg deposition over, yeah, the, the the lifetime of of those fish, but you know, sure as damn, if you take them out of the system, that that's pretty much them them done. Um, so our runs are okay. Um, you you do see some big fluctuations. We have, you know, and actually, like last year, for example, when you have big drought years, uh, people don't kind of take that into consideration as well. When you you lose a lot of um, the juvenile stock in your tributaries. When your when your tributaries go bone dry in in drought years, for for example, um, predation, you know, gusanders, uh, gusanders, cormorants. There, there's so many different parts to to to, to that jigsaw, really. Um, but there are a lot of simple fixes, a lot of stupid stuff which just shouldn't be going on nowadays. Um, we're we're very fortunate, like you know, not like. Um, I guess it'd be more the, the West coast of Ireland with the, the fish farms and stuff. Yeah. You know, we, we don't have any fish farms. Oh. Uh, no, we don't have, have any, uh, our coastline, but also we don't really have, um, I wouldn't call them fjords obviously, but that kind of, uh, you know, th those big long bays and stuff, we don't really have them in, in, in Wales. So our coastline, thankfully, um, does, does not, it's not suitable or does not support that, um, so that, that there's a blessing on that front, uh, but we still have we still have our, our our own issues and issues that, again, sad sadly issues that could be easily targeted. And our runs, um, you know, you, and you're not talking about a a long term objective. Yeah, you, you, you'd kind of see an increase in your stocks in four or five years, and that's the sad thing about it. It's not kind of you know let's look at twenty years and and there's a lot of things you know if we're sam salmon, which if I'm honest you know with all best will in the world you, you can't intervene on uh, especially how far a lot of them just kind of go away to feed when they do enter salt water but with sea trout you, you can and you could um so yeah all, all is not lost but i would say that things could be you know our, our rivers are still averaging you know like the tyvee Tawi, probably 1500 sea trout a year on rod and line for example um but that's what you know that's a third or a quarter of what it, what it was even probably 10 years ago. So, um, so things, things are okay, but it could be, uh, it could be a hell of a lot better. And the things that, you know, tangible things that you could change. I, I'm absolutely flabbergasted that the nets run without a quota system. Yeah. I, I, I find that absolutely amazing. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it, that's something I've been trying to, yeah, you know, and, and again, there is a strong heritage tradition on 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 that front. Yeah, you know, the old, uh, yeah, the, the the coracles and stuff. How the coracles were constructed. Yeah, per personally, I agree with you. I I actually do agree. You know, if there's a tradition there of something, and and I won't say people get their livelihoods, but you know, there is a tradition. Okay, that's all very well and good, but manage it. You know, absolutely, exactly. Yeah. That. I... So the tradition, and this is the argument I've had from the start. You know, if 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 the decline in suing or sea trout whichever whatever you want to call them if, if the decline continues there is no heritage or tradition 
because yeah. actually that heritage or tradition dies with the fish. So actually they have a vested interest or should have a vested interest to look after, uh, look after the fish as well. But, you know, it's, it, 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 it's a sad thing. Um, yeah. So it's, um, it, it's, it's kind of an ongoing thing. It looks to be finally NRW are looking to uh, in, implement something on, um, yeah, on a, on a quota system. Uh, but it beggars belief that we're in 2023 and, you know, that hasn't been implemented already or that it's only now finding its way to to the discussion table. Stefan, give us some insights and advice. Um, I don't know much about sea trout. I've only ever caught them by mistake <laughs> <laughs> um, out in the West. Ball the Hinch, actually, Tom, I've been on the Ball the Hinch system, caught a few um, sea trout there. If somebody wants to target sea trout, say in Ireland, for example, A, you have to find out where the rivers or the, the system has them. Yep. How do you go about targeting? So that that is definitely one of the main things, but don't then, okay, even from that perspective, what I was touching on earlier with the rivers in Wales, we have some famous rivers, but there's a lot of rivers that still have decent runs of sea trout, which just, yeah, they're not really, uh, they, they don't kind of get the, um, yeah, not broad, broadcasted to a certain extent. So, you know, you don't have to go, it, it, it kind of, you get that kind of sheep mentality of, or oh, there's fish coming off a certain river, so everybody goes there. Um, you know, if 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 your river is known for sea trout, then then, then quite simply just start there. Um, there's a few things. And one of the main things I always see is people always target sea trout as uh you know if as they would normally target brown trout or if they're targeting salmon so they never target sea trout like they're targeting sea trout so they'd always kind of you know fish as they were fishing for trout picking up sea trout or fish for salmon and then pick up sea trout so i would always say you know there is definitely a crossover between between the three of them and that's what i was kind of touching on earlier about understanding the different species and the overlap um in the daytime you know, it, it depends if you have uh, spate conditions or a dropping spate when this fish should be running, uh, whether that is fresh from the sea or actually bouncing from pool to pool. One of the best ways for sure is pulling uh, wet flies. So your traditional Peter Rosses, um, squirrel blue and silvers, um, stoats tails, things like things like that, basically, and literally just pulling them. Uh, pulling them through the pools, pulling them th- through the runs, sun rays as well. Sun rays can be absolutely lethal on a on a fall, pardon me, on a falling flood. Um, it tends to be so sizes, um, yeah, you know, compared to two 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 main differences, I would say, from a salmon perspective, even in those types of water conditions. One being the speed of the fly. It's always better to fish the fly. Well, it's always better to fish for sea trout too quickly. And that's in terms of the speed of the retrieve and also the speed you work through a pool. So it's better to fish through a pool fast rather than lead boots. Um, uh, but then also the way you fish the fly, you know, fish them a lot squarer and fish them a lot faster. Um, so you kind of get, again, you have to set your stall out versus fishing for salmon. You kind of go, no, I'm targeting sea trout. Um, and the size of the flies as well as, as a rule. You know, pro- probably smaller than smaller than you think a lot of the time. So you're looking into the water. You don't want something that's just sticking out too much because the sea trout just will not react. It's as simple as that. Um, but th- th- those are kind of the two two main so, things. Sorry there, Stefan, yeah, but well, when you say when you say small, let's say your Peter Ross, are you talking eights, tens, or twelves? What, what are yeah, you talking? Eight, eights to fourteens. Eights oh right. You, would you go to fourteens? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Especially Again, when you're down to, you know, two foot, three foot visibility. Um, yeah, no, that, that can make a big difference, to be honest. Just, just stepping it down, stepping it down. And you see people spinning, you know, I used to spin a lot. And it, it, you always see people still throwing spinners, which, you know, they're kind of way too big for the, for, for the, for the clarity of the water. And that's in particular, you're more, like, you're more likely to catch a salmon in those conditions, in fairness, when a salmon is just taking up a lie. Uh, so you're more likely to catch on, you know, some of those bigger spinners on uh, catch a salmon. The sea trouts, you just won't get a get a reaction. And, and if I'm honest, under those, when it gets to a certain clarity, um, the fly will outfish the spinner for sure. Uh, uh, yeah, I heard that said. Oh, eight, eight are, to and is this when you're saying the size there? Now, are you talking daytime 
or just or daytime. nighttime? Like, do you go bigger at nighttime? Yeah, for sure. So oh, that right. would be okay. That would be putting it bluntly. That would be tiny at night. I wouldn't mm. even. So a rule of thumb. Um, so it, it depends because if 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 you have color in the water, you can obviously fish a lot bigger. Because even you know if there's a fair bit of clar- a fair bit of color left in, you know, you're you're stripping sun rays and all that kind of stuff and. Um, it may sound daft, but if there's actually a lot of color in the water, I'll fish huge sun rays, like six, eight inch sun rays for sea trout. And you'll oh, wow. get yeah, you'll get school fish. You get three quarters of a pound sea trout taking an eight inch sun ray, no problem at all. But if if you think about it, so people always kind of, and that's the reaction to most of when you tell people that they always go wow. But then you tell people then you know they would happily fish a ten centimeter or more husky jerk or flying sea or whatever. And they'd be catching the, you know, three quarters of a pound sea trout on those spinners. But then when you tell them actually you're fishing a fly the same size, it's almost like, oh, wow, they took a fly that size. You're like, yeah, well, yeah they took a spinner that size. Well, yeah. Why wouldn't they take? And you, I see the same, you know, there's a famous river called the Till, which is a tributary of the, the Tweed up in, up in Scotland. And the Till was the same. I started going up and fishing the till and they were like, no, no, these, these fish don't take big flies. And I'm like, all right, okay, cool. Uh, and they're like, oh, so yeah, is anything coming off? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, last bait. You know, these guys were catching them on size three maps and uh, seven centimeter repellers. And I'm like, so in my mind, I'm going, okay, so they won't take big flies, but they'll take a seven centimeter repeller. It makes, <laughs> they make zero sense. Uh, and of course, it yeah, it was always the same. You know, it's, it's it's kind of a heritage tradition thing again. This is what they've always fished. This is you know the guy that's always caught the fish. That's what he always uses. And um, but a lot of the time with with your sea trout fishing, you're always adjusting. So if you're talking about okay, I just touched on the daytime there versus your nighttime. With your nighttime, it's always um, you're adjusting according to um, the uh, residual light level. So it's always stepping up the size of the fly according to the amount of residual light so essentially the less residual light the bigger the fly uh, it is not right. more complicated than that um, right. but as a rule of thumb so i'm not fishing flies unless i'm t- talking about sun rays in the daytime so my daytime fly from an overall dressed fly perspective wouldn't be over an inch long and my nighttime flies wouldn't be under an inch long so that's a good rule of thumb that's a very good rule of thumb so basically the smallest fly i'd probably fish at night is a long shank six or eight that's the smallest i'd fish at night right so through to you know a lot of the tandems and stuff that i'm using you know three inches easily three and inches. i remember like i had never tried it apart from as i said seeing my dad's friend catching one on the worm mm-hmm. uh but i i have read Fox's book yep I should, and which I love reading, but um, he mentions floating, the floating flies, the surface lures. Do you yep. use them? Absolutely, and honestly, that's the yeah. Um, it's such an ex- uh, an, an, an exciting way of targeting and, and catching sea trout. So that yeah, the kind of the skated. You, you got the, the the skated or the surface lures, um, and that can really vary from long shank muddlers through to you know you, you, again your three inch surface lures um mm. and you know when the fish are aggressive on that type of fly um and, and especially some of the late season fish you know a, a pool can literally move as the fish tries to intercept some of those surface lures uh, and that's not an exaggeration the pool literally yeah. explodes when the fish tries to to take that and you know literally the whole pool will move um, but it's, it's also a really good way of finding fish. So a lot of the time uh, you miss fish uh, with, with surface patterns, but also by moving yeah. the fish. Yeah. And actually you were talking about earlier about people going to give it a go in Ireland, for example, on a river which may not have a tradition of, mm. of night fishing. You know, if you go down, but surface lures, it has to be pitch black. So you, you don't fish that at dusk or anything. It has to be very dark. Uh, yeah, the darker the better, actually, from a surface lure perspective. But if you move the fish, you can mark the fish. Uh, and when you mark the fish, then you can go back over it later with, with wet flies, or for, uh, for example. But it's a very good way of finding fish. It's kind of the same I used to do when I was younger, you know, on a falling flood or when it was clear, actually fishing like three centimeter or five centimeter repellers, just fishing them really quickly. And you just find the fish following, but then you'd mark where the fish are holding and you can go back and target them 
uh, with a fly or whatever. But it's a, it's a really good way of, uh, of finding it. Yeah, that actually sounds like an excellent piece of advice for anybody. Let's say, and I, I think there are people who are going to be listening here and know that the, you know there are rivers around the country that are probably underfished for it. Yep. And it's a good way for guys to go out and to, and to give it a go and maybe yep. you know just try, you know? And if those rivers are good brown trout rivers, what they'll be amazed about is, is as well, and I'll probably touch on dry fly fishing at this point as well, but um, what you'll find is, you know, if, if you have, like my, you know, my home river here, the Tyvee, uh, if you have a river that's also a good brown trout river, you'll also find that you pick up um, a lot of big browns at night as well, uh, be that mm. on surface lures. They love taking those surface lures at night, especially like the... Uh, the muddlers and stuff, you know, sk- uh, skated muddlers, almost like sedges and stuff at night. Uh, but also, you know, some of the big predatory brown trout, you'll pick them up on your tandems and stuff at, at, at night as well. Um, but also, you know, if, if your river has brown trout and sea trout and you have decent hatches, decent fly life, there's no reason whatsoever that you can't target, um, especially the smaller fish. So when I'm talking about small fish, I talk about fish up to maybe two and a half pounds on the sea trout front uh, that will feed. So there's a lot of old kind of, uh, yeah, uh, you kind of talk about myths essentially around sea trout. So see, uh, small sea trout will feed in freshwater as long as that feed exists, if that makes sense. So a lot of rivers are good sea trout rivers uh, because essentially the freshwater system or, you know, the, 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 the fly life in, in fresh water is not there for them. So they're not, um, yeah, they, they then go to salt water in search of richer feeding. Um, but if, if, if you are, if you, if you do have, uh, you know, my home river is like 75, 80 miles long. So you actually have sections of, you know, some of the tributaries, which are perhaps not in such good condition or sections of the main river, not, not in such good condition. So you can actually have a good brown trout river and a good sea trout river. And where that happens, when you do have good fly life, you can absolutely have uh, sea trout feeding naturally when they re-enter uh, fresh water. And y- yeah, you'll target them as if you were targeting brown trout so you'll pick you know especially in the evening on a on a spinner fall in the evening in june for example or june into into july you know you'd be fishing uh literally as it's getting dark you're getting the bigger probably the bigger brown trout coming out of that time anyway so you target them uh, and also literally you'd be targeting uh you know sea trout on the dry flight at the same time and they they are very much feeding and they, they are very much digesting that's actually makes a, a lot of a lot of sense, but you're saying really does. Sorry, Dara. Do sea trout have lies like salmon? Uh, yes. Um, what you tend to find is the bigger fish will be solitary or, you know, in pair, you know, like twos or threes, maybe. So they will tend to have lies. Whereas if I'm honest, a, ri- a river system as a whole cannot sustain every fish to have a lie. So if you're talking about, you know, you should be talking you know, if there's thousands of sea trout coming back, not, not you know, the river just cannot give every fish. So you tend to find a shoal would be looking for a holding pool. So a holding pool, they may be looking for a back eddy. So when sea trout re- re-enter freshwater, they're looking for an easy freshwater existence. So they're not looking to, t- uh, to tackle currents, you know, whatever they, as a rule, whatever they come back into freshwater with needs to sustain them until they spawn and then go mm. back to sea or whatever to start feeding again. So if they're entering in, and that's, that is why as a rule as well, you tend to get the bigger fish first because they have bigger fat reserves to sustain themselves for longer. Um, so you, you, you tend to have them coming back in first. So, but when, when you're talking about fishing that, you know, coming back in their thousands, so they're, they're looking for an easier freshwater existence so that they don't want to burn that energy. So they will tend to hold in shoals, but hold in slower parts of the pool. Actually, quite yeah, as a rule, quite boring parts of the pool, but they can be also be the most productive parts. So I will often fish back eddies at night because if you're thinking like a sea trout, again, with your question in mind, those fish are never going to have individual lies. They may have spots, so they will often change spot from a daytime spot to a nighttime spot. Um, but as, as a rule, yeah, they're, they're still very much looking for an easy freshwater existence. And that will be slower parts of the pool, uh, like back eddies and all that kind of stuff. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. 
Tell us, Stefan, you obviously you do guiding in Wales, but you've kind of branched further afield. Am I right in terms of travels international? And <laughs> tell us about that. So yeah, I've been yeah, just passionate about traveling uh yeah anyway and it was kind of came out of university and I kind of went okay let's try and do something I'd enjoy doing uh and you know if it didn't work out I had the kind of contingency to drop back on um like my, my, yeah, my degrees and stuff from university thankfully I've never had to do that uh so I'm yeah kind of I, I'm, I'm very fortunate in getting to you know travel the world and um Kind of get to pretty pretty exotic and yes uh, sometimes yeah uh, places that and, and what I will say about fishing it gets you to places that probably if it wasn't for the fish or the fishing you just wouldn't get there uh, yeah logistically it'd be almost impossible like middle of the you know Bolivian or uh, Brazilian rainforest all this kind of stuff um, there's a place I went to in Brazil like four years ago or so um yeah the last people to visit it was national geographic for example wow. it's just like but honestly it's not something i take take for granted it's just amazing uh, amazing experiences um and then during covid i got um i got made redundant during covid so i kind of took it on myself i was like right okay this is the time to you know uh, kind of set up my own flag as it were and set set up my set up my own company uh doing what i had been doing anyway for the last 15 years or so i guess um so it was kind of yeah okay now, now is the opportunity and so that's kind of what am i up to two and a half years into that now and um slowly slowly gaining traction you know the the, the world is returning to a state of <clears throat> normality uh, but yeah, I'm, so I'm uh, recently back from Argentina. Uh, started going to Argentina 23 years ago. Uh, but again, yeah, the the principal reason for that is definitely the sea trout. Again, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, if, if you enjoy sea trout fishing, that's kind of it's the mecca, isn't it? Is it the mecca? It's special. It's be- you're talking about I was, uh, actually I was going through some stats as uh, doing a, a small piece uh, a small a small little article this morning and it's like average average weight of the fish is nine pounds uh, <laughs> and with one one in five is over 15 it's you know it's it's ridiculous yeah, in terms of a sea trout it's ridiculous you know nearly every season they get a sea trout over 30 pounds what's the best you've had down there I've had a few 20s so I've had have you yeah yeah I've had a few twenties. Uh, I had one this biggest this season uh, biggest this year was twenty two. But I've had yeah I've had a few. Honestly, uh, it may sound daft. I'm not really a numbers or um, kind of you know or how big is this habit. So I've had like six over over six or so over twenty so, something similar, um, but never actually kind of gone how big over twenty. You know, it's obvious that they're 20 20 something (laughs) yeah but yeah i'm never one to kind of come back with like a a scorecard type thing you know if if i get a good fish during the week i don't have to be then catching five six a day and you you always see it it's kind of um it's kind of a red mist thing for some people uh you know they catch a 10 oh this is a fish of a lifetime and they're related and then they kind of like it almost they almost don't let that fish absorb or absorb mm. that fish yeah. straight back in. Oh, now I've got a 12. Okay. Now I have to get a 15. Now I have to get an 18. Now I have to, I like guys appreciate what you've just landed there. These are fish of a lifetime. And okay. I I'm fortunate in that. I've been down there. Well, virtually every year for 23 years. So I've seen it and okay. You know, I've had those fish. So if it is a, you know, one trip, in a lifetime type thing, I get it. But actually, I would say that if it is that one trip in a lifetime, the worst thing you can do is set that pressure on yourself. Because actually, a lot of the time, those people that kind of go down there really relaxed and kind of go, whatever the day will bring, will bring. Uh, those are the people that will catch the most, catch the best, yeah, the biggest fish, whatever. Those that kind of go down there with you know, uh, kind of expert, uh, yeah, unreasonable expectations at times. Um, they they kind of, it's almost like something's being transmitted down the line or something. Uh, but they, yeah, that they, they're in such a, a state of tension all the time that they they never really get the best out of a trip, and they certainly don't appreciate where they are. Sometimes you just have to put the rod down 
a look around. Yeah, you, know, you may have a condor flying over you, herd of guanacos behind you, uh, all this kind of stuff. And you're kind of like, yeah, you have to appreciate where you are at times. Yeah, sometimes you just have to stop and, and stop and uh, appreciate it. Exactly. Sorry, Tom. Just one thing. Yeah, just want to ask you. Do you do night fishing for them in Argentina? So the, the random thing is the law down there, you're not allowed to, to night fish for them. Uh, so so that would be a no officially on this podcast then? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's leave that one there. <laughs> but when the law Pass changes... And move swiftly along. <laughs> I'll have a different answer when the law changes. <laughs> exactly. And do you know what? It's, it's the random thing. So over half of the Rio Grande, for example, so over half the Rio Grande uh, flows in Chile. So on the Chilean side, you are allowed to night fish. So actually, oh. I can say that, yes, I have been night fishing on the Rio Grande because I've stayed on the Chilean side several times. <laughs> there you go. That's <laughs> my get out of jail card. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stefan, you're going to be over in Ireland. So from the Rio Grande to the Adair Springs. Um, Nearly so you... as exotic, I would say. <laughs> yes. Well, Ned is. Ned's, Ned is as exotic. I, Ned's I a too. legend. <laughs> Ned's yeah. a legend, yeah. So you're coming over for the, the Irish Spring Angling Fair. It's on 29th and 30th of yeah. April. So are you going to be giving a talk on Sea Trade? Are you time flies? Tell me a bit about your involvement. Uh, yes. There's the easy answer to that. Yeah. So I'm going to be, <laughs> I think Ned's kind of, uh, he's saying, right, he's coming over. I'll rope him into everything that I can rope him into. Uh, so I'll have my uh, fish travel stand. So that's my company. So I'll have the stand at the show. I will have, uh, so I've got a sea trap book. I'll be bringing some sea trap books over with me. Uh, I'm giving a talk on both days, and that's actually going to be about sea trout. A lot of stuff, some of the stuff we've been touching on actually is about approaching sea trout. It's kind of getting rid of a few of the old um, perhaps myths about, you know, you have to do this for sea trout, you have to do that. Uh, so breaking down a bit of that kind of tactics, how to approach them, all that kind of stuff. So I'll be doing a talk. Uh, on both days and then on the stand uh, on my stand I will also be doing uh, a bit of fly tying as well so basically yes everything <laughs> I think they'll be looking for somebody to serve the drinks afterwards as well like you know <laughs> <laughs> Hey, don't, don't encourage Ned. That's all yeah, I can yeah, say. Yeah. <laughs> Ned, I was joking. Too I was late. joking. Exactly. Yeah. No, if, I, I must say, if anything, yeah, if, if if last year is anything to go by, the well, the, not only was the yeah the show fantastic, but the yeah the, just the hospitality, the welcome, everything was w- w- was amazing. So uh, very much looking forward to getting back over and supporting the guys uh, over there again, and uh, just hope they can build on it. But hopefully, you know, people will support what they're what they're trying to achieve there as well well thanks for that stefan but listen before we let you go we ask every guest on the show here we ask them their final question and um, we have forewarned you but we want you to tell us what your most memorable fish is on the fly so i'm gonna have to stick on the sea trout theme uh, i think it'd be rude not to it's gonna have to be my first ever uh first ever sea trout so everybody kind of goes i remember my first salmon uh, i think the same uh, certainly to me anyway, applies on the sea trout perspective. It was, uh, well, actually from where I'm sat now, it's probably not even a mile away uh, where I started night fishing for sea trout. Uh, and it was on a Dunkeld, a fly which randomly I've never fished uh, since since that night for sea trout. Uh, but it was, and it, it was a tiny fish, probably three quarters of a pound or so uh, on a Dunkeld on the tail uh, tail of a pool. I can literally picture it now. Uh, that must have been... 30 something yeah we'll leave it at that 30 something years we'll leave ago. It at that. Yeah, a long time ago but yeah no it would have been uh, a very small sea trout uh but again you know that uh, that's what i i was fortunate to have on my on my doorstep so it it, it doesn't really matter if it's a, a perch or a roach or, or whatever uh just kind of get out there and enjoy it that's the that's the lesson at the end of that of that story but that I, I think that's fantastic. I really do. That that's the one that sticks in your mind the most, you know. And like you've been so so involved with sea trout, but yet the one that sticks to is your first sea trout, and it wasn't huge, but nope. it was your first. Yeah, exactly. That exactly that. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, but and and they don't have to be. You know, fish can be special and memorable in in different ways. The people you're with, you know, the the, the environment, a home tied fly. Um, a rod passed down from your grandfather there's you know fish can be special to to people in different ways 
it's very true and every year we kind of collect the stories of people's most memorable fish and it's an absolute it's a fascinating episode and i encourage anybody listening to look back to the previous episodes it was at christmas where we released the first volume and just yeah. hearing those stories you know the reason for it is it kind of all adds up to why why we do fly fishing in the first place yeah. well, and how we're all so different exactly <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stefan Jones, it's been um, so insightful. Your wealth of information, I'd say, I'd say you could talk all day on this and not a bother. Um, there's so much to learn, and, and it was fantastic talking to you uh, and learning as well uh, from you about that. Um, so hopefully we might, we will see you at the fair, chat again um, for some more insights on, on sea trout fishing another time. But Stefan Jones, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks again, Jensen. Thanks for your time. Our thanks to Stefan Jones for joining us on the show. And don't forget to rate, review and follow the Ireland on the Fly podcast on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Plus you can keep up to date on IrelandOnTheFly.com as well as on Instagram and myself and Tom will be back with another episode about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. <laughs>